We're very familiar with uh, Romans 12, verse 2. Paul writes to the church and says about being transformed by the renewing of our mind. It's important to learn to see things from God's point of view. The transformation of our mind is exchanging the way we've been taught to look at things, to understanding them from God's perspective. I'm going to look at a couple Characters from the Old Testament here this morning, drawing upon last week's message and expounding upon it in Jesus' discussion with his disciples that we've been following in Matthew 24. I'm going to begin, though, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family, from your father's house, to land I will show you. Verse 4 says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. I want to highlight that same idea here between Abram, his son Isaac, and then followed by his grandson Jacob. Genesis 26, verse 1 says, There was a famine in the land, besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I shall tell you. Dwell in the land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I have given all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Verse 24, And the Lord appeared to him in the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. And he pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. God comes to Abraham and he says, Abraham, take a walk with me. The scripture says, so Abraham did. Leads him to the promised land. Isaac comes on the scene. His father, Abraham, dies. There's a famine in the land. Now get that thought. There's a famine in the land. There's no food in the land. God comes to Isaac and says, don't go to Egypt. Stay here. I'll be with you. Let me point out, there's a famine in the land. There's no food at Walmart, at Kroger's, at Meyer, at the dollar store. There's no food. Famine in the land. And God comes and says, don't go anywhere. I'm with you. So Isaac stayed, put up his tent, dug a well. Genesis 28, verse 10. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took up one of the stones of that place and put it at his head. And he lay down in a place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and his top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I'm the Lord God of your father, Abraham your father, and of God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Verse 29. So Jacob went on his journey. Jacob is leaving the land because his brother wants to kill him. 
Not quite the same thing as a famine, but very similar. <laughs> the outcome can be the same if both play out. But God comes to Jacob and he says, I will be with you wherever you go, and I will bring you back here and give you this land. So Jacob goes on his journey. Three statements. So Abraham obeyed. So Isaac stayed. So Jacob took his journey. But embedded in those little statements is a significant fact that they did not hesitate. There's no picture of any apprehension. There's no fear. They took God at what he said and they acted in complete assurance on what God had told them. There was no fear in them. They were not doubting God's faithfulness, his authority, and his power. They moved with assurance, with conviction, with resoluteness. They moved based on what God had said. God basically came to them and said, trust me, and they did. When God brought the nation out of Egypt, two guys stood fast with him, Joshua and Caleb. The rest of the nation didn't. God kept saying the same thing to them. I am with you. I will deliver you. I will take you into the land and I'll give it to you. The nation didn't trust God. Imagine how the story would have played out had they trusted God. Had the entire nation said, okay, we'll do everything you say to do. They would have marched into the promised land without trepidation, without reservation, without fear. They simply would have gone and conquered. We know that didn't play out that way. But after 40 years, God comes to Joshua because Moses has died. Page two of the notes, if you're trying to follow me there, Joshua chapter one. Beginning in verse one, after the death of Moses, the Lord the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I'm giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. Hear what he says. Every place you put your foot belongs to you. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous. Verse 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. We know that Joshua and Caleb have the faith. Joshua is now in leading of the nation. He has a job. To continue to encourage the faith of the nation. God has given him a promise. No one can conquer them. They'll overcome every person they come across. Every army they face, doesn't matter how big, how tall, how strong, 
doesn't matter their weapons. God says, you shall defeat them. Do not fear. Have boldness. Follow me. Go in and take the land. Now imagine if the people had approached it that way. But understand, when God comes to us and says, there's days of tribulation coming, I am with you. Do not fear. Be of good courage. And then the writer of Hebrews writes to the church and says to us, exhort one another daily. You see, right now, it's easy to say, okay, yeah, we did everybody handshake, smile, everybody's doing great. But what when there's famine in the land? When there's famine in the land, will we still gather? And will we gather with a smile on our face? Will we look at each other and say, God's still on the throne. God delivered today. We have food at my house. Come to my house because we have food at my house because my God is faithful. Will we do that? When the enemy wants to take us out because, oh, by the way, that's coming too. Will we gather? I wonder how many people in Lakeland are concerned about going to church today. Because last week they had a shooter. How many people got up this morning thinking, maybe I'll watch TV. It's live streamed, I'll just do that. Remember, the enemy's going to want to take us out. Will we gather? Will we smile? Will we encourage each other? Today's a good day. Today's a good day. And if the enemy comes charging in through the door, we'll say, it's a good day. Let's pray for that enemy. They need salvation. Or will we suddenly become self-focused? Oh yeah, we're going somewhere. We know the story of David, David, a little shepherd boy. His father sends him out to the battle line to check on his brothers. He hears Goliath's threats and says, who does he think he is? Well, he happens to be a rather big guy. David says, God gave us a promise. This is our land. The Philistines are standing on our land. Goliath is standing on our land. David says, you need somebody to take him out? I'll take him out. You're just a little kid. Don't care. Because the promises of God have nothing to do with my size. The promises of God have nothing to do with my strength or my ingenuity. The promises of God are the promises of God. They stand. And I will simply walk in the promise of God. And I will march out into the battlefield and I'll look at Goliath in the face and say, This day, my God takes you down. And all the world will know there is a God in Israel. And his word is faithful. Paul took a young man on a journey with him. The young man's name was Timothy. A traveling companion, a student. Paul calls him a son. But eventually Paul finds himself in prison, but there's work to be done. So he takes this son, this student, and now says, it's time for you to be 
an elder and a father to people. And he sends him to Ephesus. And he says to Timothy, don't let them look down on your youth. Stand in your faith. God did not give us a spirit, spirit of fear, of timidity, of apprehension, of hesitation. Timothy, stand in your role. Stand in the knowledge of who God is. And fight the good fight of faith. These people need to know the truth. Teach them. Correct them. And if necessary, challenge them when they're not behaving like they're supposed to. It's interesting to me that one of the most often quoted verses having to do with God's faithfulness is Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11. For as the rain comes down, waters the ground, produces crops, things spring from the earth because of it. God says, so shall my word not return to me void. But it will accomplish the purpose for why I send it. It's amazing how many times we quote that without considering the context. Isaiah and Jeremiah were prophets to the people who had walked away from God and refused to return. And because of that, God was going to come by way of the Babylonians and let the Babylonians enter the land, destroy everything, and carry a bunch of people off to captivity. And in the midst of that, God even says to the people, when they show up, surrender and go with them. People are like, what? You nuts? Because God had given them a promise. After 70 years, I'll bring you back. After a period of time, I will bring you back to this land. That's the context of Isaiah 55. When the people might be thinking... This makes no sense. You want us to go with the Babylonians and be in captivity for 70 years and then trust your word that you'll bring us back? That's the context to which God says, my word accomplishes the reason I sent it. And if I said I'm bringing you back, you will come back. You never finish that chapter. Verse 12. For you shall go out with joy. That's how this goes on. God says, yes, you're going to be in Babylon, but when I move, you're coming out of Babylon with joy because you're going home. Because my word does in fact come to pass. Let me throw a ringer in here. Page two of the notes still, if you're following me, 2 Corinthians 9. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, and he says, oh, by the way, when I was there before, I talked to you about the Jews who were hurting, and that I was taking up a collection to help them. And you all said, hey, we want to help out. So Paul writes to them and says, I'm coming back again, and I've told people about what you have said. But just in case you've forgotten, I'm sending some people ahead of me to make sure that when we get there, you have the collection all put together. He says this, 2 Corinthians 9, verse 5. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity 
and not as a grudging obligation. Hmm. How much soliciting of funds is done across the world and even in the church from grudging obligation? Drives me crazy. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality which causes thanksgiving through us to God. You say, well, what does that have to do with everything you just talked about? Because God had given them promises of taking care of the poor in their midst. And God would continue to make them fruitful as they cared for the people around them. God is faithful to his word. Whether it's giving them a plot of territory or whether it's giving us what we need for our daily living and also that we might help other people, God is faithful to his word. doesn't matter the subject. God is faithful to his word. Page 3 of the notes, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 28, Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. A couple of things I want to point out. Normally when we read through this section, we get hung up on the sin which so easily ensnares. I want to look at the thing before that. Let us lay aside every weight. What are the things that hinder or obstruct my faith in God? What are the fears? What are the doubts that influence and affect my faith in God? Now, my faith in God is displayed by my obedience, so you can extrapolate that. What fears, what doubts hinder my obedience to God? Paul goes on, writer of Hebrews, sorry, goes on. Hebrews 13, verse 1, let brotherly love continue. Now we're getting into the obedience factors. Let brotherly love continue. Do not forget to entertain strangers. For by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners that have changed with them. Those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now again, let's put that in the context of Matthew 24, which is what we're getting to. Where Jesus says there's going to be tribulation. There's going to be great tribulation. Daniel 7, Daniel 11. Romans or Revelation tells us about 
the beast that's coming into the earth, that's given permission to make war against the saints and overcome them, means he's, there's going to be a governmental system that operates in the earth that starts killing off believers. Oh, Tim, don't talk like that. Why? Does that cause fear to rise up? Well, we, yeah. Okay, but that's what we're talking about here. What are the fears and the doubts that affect my faith in God? Well, when you start talking about people killing me, that kind of gets in the way. I understand. But do we understand that the Word of God says it's not supposed to get in the way? Oh, this is the part of having our minds transformed to view things from God's perspective, to understand how the Word of God overcomes the fears in our lives so that we can remain faithful to God and stand in the faithfulness of who He is. That even in the midst of all of that stuff unfolding, Brotherly love will still continue, and I will not forget to entertain strangers. Well, I don't know if they're the enemy. Gee, God didn't delineate that here, did he? But God has said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Therefore, we can boldly say, what can man do to me? To which people's normal response is, well, they can kill you. <laughs> they can destroy this earthly vessel. They can cause it great pain. But I have a promise from my father. Because in reality, I am a spirit housed in an earthly vessel. Destroy the vessel, the spirit continues to exist in the hope of glory. This thing causes me lots of problems anyway. I like it because it's the only one I got. But there are many days it causes me problems. I'm ready for the glorified body. Because according to the scriptures, the glorified body can't have arthritis. Doesn't get the flu. Doesn't catch colds. Exactly. One of my great things of getting to heaven, as I've said before, is the fact that all of you people who think you're not colorblind are going to find out that you had been and that I've been right all along. Tell me that's not purple. Of course it's purple. What I say is green is green. What I say is brown is brown. And what's wrong with everybody else? God intends for us to live through faith in who he is. So when Jesus talks to us, we have to understand that's the viewpoint in which he's speaking. Page 3 of the notes, Matthew 24. Verse 15, Jesus is talking to his disciples about when all of this stuff is going to occur. We're jumping partway into the conversation. We've already read some of it. Verse 15 begins, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, just to gain the context here, Jesus is pointing their attention to Daniel chapter 11. A couple weeks ago, we looked at this. Daniel chapter 11, there's two kingdoms that lie to each other 
and then the one kingdom decides, I'm going to take over the world. And in the process, he comes into the promised land, and he destroys the religion of the Jews. He puts up his own idols in the temple. He makes war against the saints. And in that same process, we find out that believers do mighty exploits and teach people the truth and continue on the ministry of the gospel. All of that stuff is what's happening in Daniel 11. This is what Jesus is talking about. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to get anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babes in those days. And pray that your flight not be in the winter of the Sabbath. Let me just talk about that for a second. Pregnant ladies have trouble running. Plain and simple. Nursing mothers have to tend to their baby. Not being on the Sabbath in their day, you were limited how far you could walk on the Sabbath and not consider being work. Now again, that none of that actually applies. Jesus is simply drawing upon an understanding here. That when I tell you to flee... You've got to have endurance. Now, as we drew upon last week, I want to reiterate this week, Jesus' point of view is not fleeing from fear. We are fleeing because a governmental system has entered into the promised land and taken over that does not want Christians there. Therefore, the point of view is, Fine, I'm going somewhere else. You say, but no, we're supposed to stand and fight. Understand what God is telling us at this moment in time. God is saying the same thing as he was saying to them when the Assyrians followed by the Babylonians were coming to the land. I have removed my hand of protection. I am allowing them to come. You cannot win against them. I'm not fighting with you against them. I'm letting them come into the land. There's reasons for it. One of the big reasons is God says you've rejected me. You haven't wanted me. You've wanted to worship other gods. Fine, I'm going to let you experience what it's like to have life the way you think you want it to be. So God says I'm stepping back. God said to the Israelites in their day, do not, do not fight the Babylonians. You will not win. So in the same way, Jesus is saying to us, when this stuff starts to unfold, understand, church, you cannot win. The battle is not fighting this government that's coming. The battle is to stay in faith in who God is. And if God says leave, it's time to leave. That's putting our faith in operation. So when the movement is to push us out, God says, leave. And don't try and go grab all of your stuff. Why? Because it's going to be a weight that holds you down. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I know where you are. I know what you need. And I am there to supply it. I worked with a gentleman who had been an officer in the South Korean Army. South Vietnamese. He was one of the boat people back in the 70s. I was talking to him one day about his experience. He said, Tim, you have to understand. He held a high position in their country. He was also part of the military. 
And when it was time to leave, they had to get out. He said, I went home. I took my family. We went down to the shore and got into a little boat with only the clothes we had on. And we pushed out into the water. And that's how they got to this country. They left everything, everything behind because it was not time to try and hold on or stay. It was time to leave. And they came here and they rebuilt from nothing. This is nothing new that Jesus is talking about. It's happened before. It's just where are we in our faith walk with God to recognize what's going on and understand what God's telling us to do. <clears throat> Jesus is trying to make it clear that when these things begin to unfold, you can't stop it. Because God has stepped back and is allowing it to play out. And we know that because of Daniel. We know that because of, of uh, Zechariah. We know that because of Ezekiel. We know that because of Revelation. That God is letting this play out. And we need to have his wisdom. Doesn't mean we don't pray for the salvation of people. But there's a difference between going to war spiritually and going to war against something that we cannot win against. He said, well, you're saying God's not big enough. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying God has given us orders. <laughs> Don't fight this thing in the earthly realm. There's work to be done, and there's work to be done in other places. Page four of the notes, Psalm 3. I love this psalm. <clears throat> David's kingship was being challenged by one of his sons, Absalom. And David leaves the area. <coughs> he writes this, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. David understands the moment, but he also understands the promises of God. That God made David king. And one of his descendants would be king, but it wasn't going to be Absalom. But David also knew at that moment it wasn't the time to fight. So again, understand what's happening here. A king is leaving his palace. The king is leaving his city. The king is going into the remote places of the land to avoid this conflict. But in the midst of it all, he knows the Lord is working on his behalf, and that God will deal with the enemy. Everybody okay? A little more. Matthew 24, verse 23. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. 
For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Always an interesting ending of that thought. Understand what Jesus is saying. My coming will be visible regardless of where you are. When I come, my glory will be seen everywhere. So if they tell you I'm over there in that town, don't go over there, I'm not there. If they say, well, he's out here in this wooded lot, don't go out there, I'm not there. When I come, you will know it. It's the same thing as you'll know where the dead body is because of the vultures that are circling. There will, in other words, there will be signs in the sky that I've arrived. That's what he's saying. But remember the context. There's a government that's occupying the earth that's against the church. Believers have run to go somewhere else, to not get engaged in fighting that earthly war. And it's while we are somewhere, more than likely a deserted place, somewhere, there's going to be people who come into the camp saying, hey, Jesus is over here. And believers are going to say, fantastic, the Savior's arrived. Let's go. Understand again what Jesus is saying. No one will have to come into the camp and tell you I've arrived. You will know I have arrived. Because the skies will proclaim my glory. You will know when I've come. Until then, don't believe the reports. Understand what that means, folks. It means staying in the desolate places. It means trusting God for the daily manna. In the midst of the whispers that Jesus has come. And how many people are going to think, if he's come, let's go to him. Do you understand the temptation? But here we are in a camp of 15, 20, 50 people. And 45 of them are saying, we heard that Jesus is there, we're going. What are we going to do? Guys. That's not what Jesus said. Somebody's got to hold the line. Somebody's got to speak the truth. No, we're going to stay here. I'm sick of being here. Yes, so am I. But guess what? We're supposed to stay here. Because Jesus said when he comes, we'll know it. And it's easy to talk about this prior to being in that condition. And that's why Jesus goes over this so much. This is a lengthy conversation that he's having with his disciples to try and help them understand what walking in obedience to his word is all about. Because when the day of trouble comes, everybody's going to be looking for the solution. What's the way out? When we're hungry and we're hurting, living under threats, it's going to be easy to be drawn to a Savior. Read just a little bit more. Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. Now, understand, Jesus has not said when he's coming. He has simply said to them, when I come, you will know it. 
Now he gets back to a timing thing. After the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Verse 31, And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Do you hear the timing? Jesus says, rumors of wars and wars, difficult things are coming, some form of tribulation that's going to be followed by the great tribulation, things of which the earth has never seen before. And after that, the Son of Man will come in His glory and it will be the sound of the trumpet and the redemption of those that are His. Let me do it the other way. Tribulation, great tribulation, sorry, I'm thinking about people watching. Great tribulation, the glory of God coming, the sound of the trumpet, and what we call the rapture. Let me do it one more time. Tribulation, great tribulation, Jesus' is glory, rapture. Are you getting this? Notice where the rapture shows up. Over here. After tribulation. After great tribulation. Over here. Jesus sums all this stuff up here in chapter 24. So whenever we read other places in the scriptures about his coming, we have to put it in the context of what Jesus is telling us. We may not like to hear that, but again, if we get a renewed mind, then this discussion should not bother us. You say, but there's suffering involved. God is still God. And God wants to do things. Because in the midst of all of that tribulation, God is still working to reach the hearts of the unbelieving. And he needs you and I to be his witnesses in the earth. We have a function to be as witnesses. To be witnesses of who he is. His love, his mercy, his desire for redeeming. We are to be witnesses of that. I'm going to end here today. We'll start to unfold the next part here next week. Everybody all right? All right, would you stand with me this morning? <laughs> Almighty God, we thank you and praise you that, Lord, you come and you pour out your grace in this earth and upon us that, God, we can walk in your strength. We can walk in your peace. We can walk, Lord God, in your gentleness and in your kindness. That, Father, it's not dependent upon the circumstance we're facing, but Lord God, that you can flow in and through us despite the circumstance. Because that, Lord God, is the revelation of who you are and who we were created to be, and it is the power of truth, of the salvation of Jesus that he brought into the earth to transform us back into our original design. Father, I pray, let your words 
dismantle every hindrance, every fear that currently occupies our being, that we can walk in your boldness and in the assurance of your presence that you will be all that you have promised to be. And that death is not something to be feared. Because it's, it just sets us free to step into eternal glory. Father, transform our thinking that your peace can occupy our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name we pray.